having this amazing conversation. So, like Suhasini very helpfully suggested to all of us how to structure, I think, the scale, the way it is moving from the larger policy dimension that looks at migration due to climate change and the idea of resource extraction and nature extracting back from us. What I'm going to focus on is to look at the idea of disaster and disaster risk in the specific context of Kerala. So this is not a prescriptive model to say do this and don't do, do this, but to be able to unpack the idea of a disaster because there are many, many different imaginations of what a flood is or what a disaster is. So flooding is not something that is specific to one region or something very unique. And in fact, over the last 10 years, not just in India, across the world, urban flooding is becoming an issue. In, in fact, I always uh, say that like in the 1890s and 1900s, the way epidemics reformed cities, the plagues and all the other epidemics, it's actually the flooding that is going to reform the way we imagine urban and living spaces across the world because it is an increasingly difficult issue. It's not just loss of property. We try to look at it as loss of property, but there are many, many more issues. Could be lives, could more importantly, livelihoods are lost and regeneration time after each disaster becomes increasingly worse. So I need to figure out a way to get this done. Yes, so <clears throat> the idea of looking at these are <clears throat> floods are not just limited to where you expect them to happen, such as along the coast or next to a river. It can happen on top of plateaus, it can happen on hills, it can happen in the desert. Uh, Jodhpur, for example, has consistently flooded for the last four years. And, and all of this is actually very clearly man-made disasters. Man-made in the sense of how Prashant was explaining a unthinking way of either building a road or not putting a culvert. It could be simple acts, simple in the sense of not meaning to damage something, but simply forgetting to be sensitive to a certain issue. So, and specifically I'm looking at urban flooding in this case because the like I mentioned, the amount of damage and the recuperation time is much more serious in urban areas. And the urban flooding is a combination of the system of sanitation, management of land and land resources, pattern of settlements, uh, urban infrastructure. Added to it is the incidence of urban heat island, which increases rainfall. So there's a whole complex of issues. It's not something that can be solved by one disaster management agency. And what's very important is at the time of a disaster is the many, many reactions or non-reactions of different stakeholders that happens of why did this disaster happen? How much damage did it do? Why did it do? Is always a very, very difficult conversation in, in any society. So technically speaking, if you're looking at, if you have to uh, put a value to what is the possible risk from a disaster, it's, it has two very distinct components. One is the magnitude of the natural hazard, which is most often beyond human control. It could be the tsunami, it could be an earthquake, it could be any of these things. But what is even more important than the magnitude is the degree of the vulnerability of people and the landscape. How vulnerable are these things to any kind of change. And this is something that is under human control. We have some agency to be able to influence this part. What's also clear across looking at, you know, uh, disasters across the world is that the vulnerability is not so much about poverty or about living in hazardous area, but it's also a very, very clear indicator of the success of development programs or the maturity of development programs. And when I say development programs, I need to qualify it. These are not physical infrastructure we are talking about. This is across the human development indices, every single development that happens. 
A classic case is the Caribbean Sea, which on an average sees eight to 10 typhoons, cyclonic storms. And every single year, you will see that countries like Honduras or Haiti are devastated. Cuba, which is 30 kilometers away from the Haiti uh, coast, reports nearly zero loss. So the loss here, as compared to loss of life, loss of livelihood, most important time required to jump back to normalcy. That is what defines the disaster. So you, you can see the same hurricane devastated Haiti with more than 100,000 lives lost, zero lives lost in Cuba, not because they have a seawall or magic, because they have developed a social and political system that is ready to respond to this immediately. Uh, what those factors are, it will vary from society to society, but it's important to understand that it's not only a blame game to say the flood happened or the hurricane happened and hence the damage was more. So th there are two understandings for this and, and I'm using a little bit of theory to be able to ground it in the context of Kerala. So please bear with me here. So there is the idea of disaster risk as a vicious circle that Failure in development means that the people are more vulnerable. Every time a disaster happens, it holds back further development because you have no more money left for the social development. Every little money that comes in actually goes into managing or rehabilitating the disaster, which increases the vulnerability, which reduces the society's capability to respond, and then that's a vicious circle. So year on year, Kerala is a very, very good illustration here, 2018 and 2019, you actually had no time to recuperate. And the good part is that there are many, many other indices that is working for the people here. Could be health, education, higher social indices, which actually helps you to reduce your vulnerability for the next cycle. But if this is understood at a very local level and how this can become a tool, then you can actually make it into a virtuous cycle. We can do very little about the actual natural phenomena, increased rainfall incidence or sea level change. But there are mechanisms that we can put in place that will help us adapt or mitigate some of these things. <clears throat> so whenever we talk of disasters, including uh, you know, sea level change, uh, rise and other things, there are two very clear paths that can be understood. One is that you can only adapt to a certain change. I cannot do anything about the change. The sea level and the consequent migration that uh, Katie talked about is a good example. You will need to adapt to it. And there are those other changes. Okay, before we look at the other changes, climate change and uh, its... Uh, prophecies of doom if you believe one sector and prophecies of lies if you believe the other sector uh, have just become tools in everybody's hands. There can be very, very different predictions. If we say that after two degrees of temperature rise and the sea level rises five meters, uh, the only people who will actually need to think about it twice are the ones whose house is on the coast. If I'm sitting in Bangalore, why the hell will I care about sea level change? or if it is going to change the way my economy works and I have to shift my economic model, then I'm going to find excuses to say why this is not so. And every time there is a disaster, again, taking the Kerala floods as an example, we come up with these very specious arguments in media. It could be technical or non-technical people. They will throw up a 100-year data and say, oh, but the rainfall has not increased. It only increased by 2%. This is caused by something else. Uh, if, if you take an analogy, you, you can, it's like trying to tell a person with diabetes. Most people in the audience won't know what diabetes is, but the older ones will. It's like saying it's not because I ate two rasgullas yesterday that I got diabetes today. It's a whole lifestyle that has happened. So climate change and the impact of climate change is similar to that. You can't point out one incident or one non-incident and then say this is true or false. So, so this is very, very important to understand. 
this is not a doomsday, this is not simply to scare everyone to say there is no hope left, but it's like a traffic light. There is a good reason why there is a traffic light, because you will get killed if you don't, if you ignore it. Climate change predictions are very much like that. The only reason we ignore it is the older people will all be dead by the time we see the impact, so we don't care. And the younger people are going to be misled by all the media and you will be the one who will be facing the consequences. So coming back to the disaster risk, we talked about adaptation in the case of, say, extra large events like uh, climate change or earthquake or a tsunami. And then there is the mitigation which is very clearly predictable. There are events that happen which have a clear pattern those events can be controlled and managed by humans at different levels where you can either reduce or minimize or nullify the impact of the disaster. You're not going to take away the disaster, but you're going to reduce its impact. So the case of Kerala, there are multiple views. If you see the Central Water Commission, it says, oh, there was no floods because the dam gates were opened, it was perfectly normal. Then there are environmentalists who are saying, oh, this is happening because of X happening in Wayanad and Y happening in Vembanad. Then there are politicians and planners who are looking at a different story. This is not to point fingers at everyone. This is simply to say that there are multiple viewpoints to this. So there is n this is not a technical solution where I have a headache, I take a crocin and I go home. It doesn't work like that. But it's, it's very interesting that the floods was not merely limited to water courses or low-lying areas. The flood and the rain damage was across all the three clear ecological zones in, in the state, and which should be a clear warning that it is not caused by a single factor or a single mistake. Of course, the last two years, rainfall was way above normal. It, was, it broke all the barriers about normality. Even the Met Department has 10, 20, 30 percent variation possible. Here, in certain cases, you were looking at 90 and 95 percent variation from the normal. So it was very, very abnormal. But what's also very interesting is, and from my very limited Malayalam, this is what I understood when the Honorable MP was speaking that while the floods happen every year, two years, and we wake up, it's actually the drought that is going to kill the state in the next 20 years. So it's not that we can put all our energies on solving the flood problem while ignoring the problem of drought, which is actually going to affect many more people, but that is a more long-term, more uh, extended, uh, impact, which means that you are actually not feeling it in a single year. Typical predictions, which are very clear by the IPCC for the Indian subcontinent, especially the south of India, says that there is going to be increased incidence of rainfall. You may still be getting 1,800 mm in Todupula, for example. That is not going to change. But instead of raining over 60 days, you're going to get that rain in three days which means your annual average may not change, but your intensities would change. This coupled with increased heat is actually a very, very important factor because increased heat during the rest of the year means that the soil is drying out faster. The faster and the more the soil is drying out, it is more prone for erosion. That, when hit with very heavy rainfall, increases erosion by a factor of 10 or even 100, given the slopes of uh, land in Kerala. So these two combinations are going to make all the changes in the landscape that we are looking at. Now, if, if we start looking at what are the sum of the factors that contribute into it, now we know the large level challenges, but if we start identifying the smaller level one, for example, occupation of land. We can't call it a planning pattern in Kerala because it's not typical of the urban spaces everywhere else, uh, which were homes and homesteads that occupy farmland, edge of forest, plantations. And that, of course, has 
increased in density. One cannot do much about it, but what, what is worrying is the scale and the period within which it is increased. From 150 urban centers, it is 500 odd urban centers in a 10 year gap. And that's a very, very massive increase. Yeah, 159 in 2001 to 520 in 2011. That's a really massive increase. Now, is this merely because we have more people to accommodate? Not necessarily so, because Kerala has one of the lowest population growth rates in the country. So it's not like we have more people to settle in this. There are other reasons, uh, social and economical. So if, if you look at these multiple things, what boils down to, and this is what Prashant mentioned in his presentation is that there is the idea of land capacity which needs to be understood. It's not merely looking at land as an economic resource on which I can draw whatever patterns. It is to ensure that the development we are looking at is responsive to the capacity of the land. You can carry, call it carrying capacity like the term Katie used, there can be many, many definitions. Essentially what is that land meant for? Is it meant as a sponge for water or is it meant as a giant slope to take away the water, for example, gives very different understandings of that land. So to put it very, very bluntly, if we were to look at 2018, 17 floods, it's the combined intense rainfall events. They were very intense, way above nor uh, normal and the reduced land capacity. Why are we saying reduced land capacity? It's not just the urbanization that is there, but while we cannot do anything about the increased incidence of rainfall or the volumes, what we can do and we should do is to address the rate of runoff, which is what actually causes all the damage, right? Uh, increased runoff happens for many reasons, which we will see. It simply means faster inundation. Faster inundation means reduced response time. In, let's say, 20 or 30 years ago, if the same rainfall had happened, let's say, in Iduki, it would have taken maybe three days for that droplet of water that fell to reach Todupula, which is just down the hill. Today, that same drop of water probably reaches there in three hours which means your ability to predict and respond to these events is getting shorter and shorter. And of course, it is not just the flow of water, it is the massive movement. And here you know from newspaper reports, more lives were lost from landslides than from drowning. So this is a much bigger killer, especially given the fragility of the ecosystem that we are occupying in the hills. And this cycle simply means that the next time these rains happen, the land has even further reduced its capacity. There is erosion, there is loss of cover, means that the next rains will have even shorter durations for flow. So land cover change we already saw, and this is true across Kerala. This is not only limited to the urban centers, uh, or the five or 10 major uh, municipalities. This is across Kerala. And land cover change, of course, is also because of this thing which many people, I'm sure if I were speaking to a very patriotic person from Kerala, would not like. Because we have this imagination of the God's own country as being green. Yes, the color is green, no doubt about it. But the quality of that green has changed tremendously over the last 40 years. I don't even need to give you statistics. And the changes in the agricultural pattern, it's not like you're, you can argue that, oh, but these are plants that have always grown here. Of course we know that. But the way they were grown and harvested and managed has changed tremendously. Which means that the flooding that happened downstream in, where in, Cochin is not only because of the bad planning of Cochin city, which is also responsible, but it is because of the way spices are grown 200 kilometers away. And this is the biggest 
changer because the way agriculture is practiced, was practiced and is practiced is very, very different and the way it is being practiced means that you're leaving the land fallow for longer periods of time between harvests, which is causing more erosion. Erosion means that there is less productivity next year, so you're adding chemicals, so it's another vicious circle for the next cycle. So this is not to say that we should stop all agriculture. Spice and spice markets were not invented 20 years ago. This has been Kerala's mainstay for 2,000 years. You would trade Roman gold for equal weight in pepper, right? Which meant there, there is a deeply embedded traditional knowledge of how these things are done and done right. And when you actually change that pattern, this is what the pattern would have been 50 or 100 years ago where what we are calling as managed or tended forests. You would still have a larger biodiversity, larger tree cover, and the spice. Spice I'm giving as an example, but this is true for most other things also. Has been replaced by this, which means the reduced capacity of the land, it is, it is having multiple cascading impacts. Right now, we are only talking of the flood as an impact. We are not even talking of the social or economic or any other dimensions. So, where should banana grow? Where should rice grow? Where should vanilla grow? Is not merely driven by market demands. It has to be derived by the land capacity. So, and, and at that point, you need to understand that land and land capacity is not merely an economic device to say two cents of land for 30 lakh rupees here and eight lakh rupees there determines its cost. It's also the embedded ecosystem services that any piece of nature, this is a very broad definition, it could be a river, it could be a hill, it could be a sacred forest, it could be any of these things, are multidimensional. So this, clearly the idea of showing this is that the conversation is not conservation versus development you should understand that it is conservation for development. There is always this understanding that if you're conserving more land, we're asking you to develop less. And when I'm using the term develop, it's economic, social, and so on. But if you do not have conservation, you cannot have development in 10, 20, 30 years time. Right now we are externalizing those costs. It is going to hit home someday. So it, it's important that while our right now the concentration is on what we call the built capital, so many rupees per square feet, so much money for roads or infrastructure or telecom, they're actually embedded in what we call the capital of the ecosystem. If this is not stable and healthy, there is nothing on the planet that can make the top healthy. So we've discussed this, I'm gonna skip uh, this particular one uh, segment, next few slides, is on the provocation of Abid because he said this is a very specific issue that touches all of us, please address this. So, and like Katie repeatedly mentioned in the morning about the connect of the people of Kerala to the land is very, very special, very precious and something that is not open for negotiation most of the times, which is how it used to be. Now, if I were to take the same pattern and continue it, I will still have the same piece of land. I'm not commenting on the quality of the aesthetics or the technology, which the next two speakers will quite easily rip apart. But what concerns me, and this is, I've spent a fair amount of time over 20 years in Kerala, so I'm not parachuting into the place. Each of these gulf homes, if I can use the term without any denigration, typically sits in its own piece of land. It's not really sitting on the highway like your traditional homestead was. So this is a back of the envelope calculation that I did, that if I were to look at 2.4 million Malayalis, out of which 10% build homes, out of which 5% and so on, I can easily estimate that about 1.2 lakh kilometers of bad, unsafe roads are built only to service these individual homes, which you can imagine what a massive impact it will have on the land. 
And remember, this is not merely a number to bandy about. I'm coming back to the amount, the loss of lives in the flood. More than half the loss of life was due to uh, soil slippage, landsliding, and things. Most of it caused by this kind of informal construction. That I have 10 cents of land, which is half a kilometer away from the main road. I, earlier, I would have a footpath to it. Now I need a motorable road because the car has to reach there. I'm not going to use high standards of engineering to build it. There's no culvert, there is no revetment, nothing. Most loss of life happened because of this. So this is not about how ecological the home that I'm building. It's how ecologically I'm going to go and reach that home from the main space. This, though, has, there are arguments about how the whole issue of quarrying impacts the floods. There are many, many different versions, and I will not go into the technicalities. The only reason I'm bringing this in is for two reasons. The quarries are there because there is a demand. It's not like somebody is quarrying because they don't like forests, right? Somebody needs to build a house, somebody needs to build a factory, and that needs more material and hence more quarrying. So if you're actually looking at the idea of a quarry, it, you need to question the kind of buildings that is happening down the stream. Is it more concrete, more stone, more laterite, whatever else we imagine, has to have an ecological footprint somewhere deep in the forest. And it's actually quite shocking that, uh, like the forest laws Prashant was mentioning and we were discussing how it is deteriorating across the country. In a single year, the required buffer for a quarry was reduced from 500 to 50 meters for the state of Kerala. Okay, because their imagination is, okay, if the quarry is here, the elephant and the tiger can still move there because they have a boundary wall or something like that. But the real impact of a quarry actually happens because of what we call the sonic boom that goes, travels through the ground. Sound travels at 330 meters per second in air. It travels 10 times to 17 times, depending on the kind of soil, through the earth. And when that sound, in this case, vibrations are traveling through, this is not about protecting the wildlife. This is dislodging entire mountain ranges, rendering them weak for the next heavy cycle of rains. So you may not see the impact of the rain in and around the quarry. You may see it five kilometers away. And those are incredibly difficult to either predict or control. I thought she was going to kick me out. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so that's the number, 17 times. So the subterranean vibrations that is causing by even small mines, they don't have to be massive mines, are causing incredible instability in the upper slopes everywhere. Okay, so this is the greening bit I was talking about, which means that now we're not only exploiting the land, but we've actually become conspicuous consumers of that landscape. Okay, so the landscapes are not changing because I have a little lawn in front of my house. Entire hill ranges are changing because of the way we want to imagine that they need to be consumed. Uh, which, okay, this makes me sound a leftist, maybe so, I have no defense, but this is really having immense, immense impact on landscapes across the state. And, and this is all the more true, unfortunately, only in Kerala because of the level of success you've had in the tourism industry. So this is the fallout that comes home after many years. So th this is the landscape of consumption that I'm talking about. You've had a loss of 50% of the forest in less than 50 years. 50% of forest cover. And yet, when you actually look at a satellite image, an undisturbed satellite image, all of the areas will still look green. It's not like we have removed the forest and created barren grounds there. Except the quality and the type of the green cover has changed, like I mentioned earlier. And 
this if were, if somebody were to argue that this will have no impact on natural cycles or flooding or anything that would need a very very different kind of a reality check this is in fact one of the largest losses of forest cover anywhere in the country except uttaranchal i think so after all the bashing that i had to do i'm sorry my apologies let's see what are the strengths that are unique to this place which can actually help us tackle this reduce vulnerability increase the resilience for the next cycle of disasters whatever the nature of the disaster right now we were only talking about floods but it can easily and should include climate change and drought and all the other cycles so that the biggest biggest advantage is that the level of decentralization and empowerment that we have in the state is unparalleled anywhere in the country uh, you have all the five levels of governance not just three tiers but you actually have five tiers of governance which is extremely empowered village committees well, at the village and the gram panchayat and the mandal level uh, the, these birds are different in different parts of the country but i think in kerala if i'm not mistaken you use block and district uh, so what this essentially means is that the devolution of power is not just the democratic process that i'm concerned with but it is the level of change that can be instituted at the village level and when we are using the term to define development let's say when you make a integrated village development plan which is what every village panchayat does uh, as an annual document we no longer have to be looking at it as development meaning construction development does not mean adding roads or telephone networks alone development in fact if i i don't remember the number but the only panchayats that actually have climate change as a recognized uh, issue are in kerala nowhere else in the country you actually have village level discussions that are discussing threats from climate change which means this is a wonderful opportunity to be able to do the change from completely ground up <clears throat> lots of different models all the ones that i'm showing are not exported these are studies done by academics on panchayats in kerala in in terms of its effective mobilization of different stakeholders the consultation process that happens so what this actually tells us is that here is a very valuable opportunity for us to bring nature natural systems uh, land land capacity productivity conservation all of them back into the center of the conversation maybe they were the centers of conversation in an unconscious way 50 years ago this is the traditional knowledge that one refers to where you don't have to write it down in a book but everybody knew you don't build on this place because it's waterlogged right that's part of the traditional knowledge now that did not need documentation but at this point given the high levels of not just literacy but also the high levels of awareness and involvement at the most local uh, governance units if it is possible that this kind of a conversation where which affects not just the village but the larger the greater common good for people across the region actually becomes central to village development plans uh prashant has already mentioned about this but what i would like to highlight from the gadgil report it's very unfortunate how the a technical scientific understanding actually gets politicized for all the wrong reasons but what's very important is this one prediction that looked at the eco sensitive zones and the damage wrought by the floods and it's pretty much a very very close match you don't need like ian mccag's famous map you actually didn't need a prediction for this because one knew this is bound to happen however this does not mean that we are looking at the the way sometimes the gadgil report is looked at where it, you know it's accused that oh i'm going to evacuate all these people from all the hills that's not what the report is talking about at all that is a very very wrong interpretation what 
the report recommends is to form village and micro level committees that looks at water and biodiversity and all the issues and do the management at the local level. Which essentially means that if we are looking at the idea of nature as infrastructure, given all the capacity, infrastructure not as pipes and roads, but in terms of what it can offer humans, you can go from a very highly engineered situation or the imagination of development we have today to one that's ecologically engineered. You still get the same services, you still get access to clean water, you get sanitation, you get waste recycling, but you could push that in a way that it is not reliant on built or engineered systems, but on ecological systems. It, these are actual working documents from other places uh, where it's it's important to understand whenever we are saying that it's conservation for development, we are not saying that we should go back a thousand years in time and live like our forefathers. That's not the idea at all. It's simply a different way of engaging with the landscape. And one way to engage with that landscape is, for example, the tool uh, Prashant mentioned, whether it is geodesign or GIS, where you can spatially map the capacities of each of these lands could be the edge of a river, edge, uh, edge of a backwater, side of a slope, anything. And then use that space for the function that it is meant for. Even when we say it is a buffer, buffer does not mean no use land. Buffer simply means that there is a core activity that should never be disturbed. And the idea of the buffer is to keep other influences out. Which, but the buffer can still be used in many ways for the benefit of humans. There are also many technical tools available. Most of, when I say technical, this is simply to document it in a proper way. If I were to replace all these fancy drawings and documentations with simply traditional knowledge systems, it is not going to change the outcome. But the idea of doing this is to demonstrate that if this is the condition A, which leads to this hazard B, this is the way that this hazard can be either adapted to or mitigated by doing physical steps. Sometimes these things become quite useful because words may not be taken as seriously or not be understood as clearly as when we would actually spatialize all these solutions. These, many of these are available. In fact, this is actually from an exercise in a village. Uh, so the idea is you don't have to have only fancy tools, but the understanding of what is a steep slope, what is an ecologically sensitive area is already embedded. We just need to reinforce it using systems, which can then help the further development in the words that Katie refused to use, but the only one I can think of is a sustainable and equitable development. Thank you. So I'm saying that you, it's not enough to say that no people know how to do things. The policies, the enabling mechanisms have to be designed to help them, to be able to move things in the direction that you want things should move in.